So we're going to be talking about what is, is very common in syntactic theory, and that is the idea that semantic asymmetries among predicates, um, predicate arguments, are mirrored by asymmetries in the syntax. And this is found in many different frameworks and has its roots in a number of assumptions. One is that each semantic argument is associated with a, a unique syntactic role. The other is that each argument can bear only a single grammatical function or a single structural relation to the verb. And then finally, that every grammatical relation or syntactic role is restricted to a single appearance in a clause. Now, this follows from fundamental pr um, principles in the, in the architectures of a number of frameworks. So back in um, relational grammar, there was straight uniqueness. Lexical functional grammar had functional uniqueness. And then in principles and parameters and minimalism, it doesn't follow from a single principle, but it seems to um, be an emergent property of, of the Utah and also binary branching. So the theoretical question that we're going to be talking about is how to account for evidence reflecting various types of symmetrical object behaviors. And there's been lots and lots of research on symmetrical and asymmetrical objects, um, a lot of it in the LFG literature and a lot of it in the GB principles and parameters literature and among and others as well. And the common response to symmetrical behaviors has been to modify the implementation of the theory in a way that still preserves the asymmetrical architecture. So to have some kind of workaround that allows you to have symmetry in us essentially asymmetrical theory. Now we're going to explore an alternative approach within HPSG because HPSG unlike other frameworks hasn't argued for its theoretical assumptions on the basis of asymmetrical or symmetrical objects. In fact it's been largely silent on multiple object constructions. And furthermore HPSG does not make the assumptions that we saw in two and therefore permits the flexibility to directly account for syntactic symmetries while also allowing for other asymmetrical behaviors. And so we would like to particularly thank Ivan for being involved in developing a framework that has the flexibility to account for data that the theory hasn't necessarily looked at before. And we're going to be doing this in the context of objects in a language called Moro. Moro is a Kordofanian language spoken in the Nuba Mountains in Sudan. And as a Kordofanian language, it's probably distantly related to Bantu languages. Um, Moro shows many striking similarities to Bantu in terms of um, syntax, in terms of morphology and phonology, but has practically no cognates with Bantu. So it's one of these, these, um, these classification conundrums. What's important to us is that it has a basic subject verb object word order, which we'll see in a minute. In fact, right here. So here's a basic transitive sentence in Moro, cuckoo hid the cups, and you notice that the, the object comes after the verb. When the object is realized by a proper name, it optionally bears a case suffix, which is the bold-faced engma, which we're going to gloss as accusative. When it's pronominal, it appears as an object marker attached to the verb, and you can see that also in bold-faced. Also, objects can passivize, and you see that the verbs passivize with the passive morphology un in seven. And so, in general, if you want to say what, what constitutes an object in Moro, it has the various properties. Post-predicate position when it's not a pronominal, the ability to bear accusative case when it's a proper name, the ability to be realized as an object marker when it is pronominal, and the ability to undergo passivization. So these are fairly standard tests for objects. In eight, we see an example of a ditransitive clause. I gave the girl to the man, or I gave the man to the girl. Notice this is ambiguous. And so either nominal can bear either of the semantic rules. Both internal objects of give exhibit the full range of object behavior. So either, both of them can be accusative marked as a nine. In 10, um, one of, either of them can be represented as an object marker. And notice again, nine and 10 are both ambiguous. So it's not clear. Um, I, so the semant there's not a clear alignment between word order or what's being shown up as an object marker um, and the semantic role. And then in 11, we have passivization. And again, the same ambiguity obtains. Moro is a symmetrical language in the sense that these object properties can be born, can be exhibited by both of the objects simultaneously. So in 12a, we see both of the objects being realized as object markers, again with the ambiguity. And in 12b, we see one of, the, one of the arguments passivizing and the other being realized as an object marker. 
and again being um, ambiguous. And the, op the order of the object marker is based on person number hierarchies um, and, uh, and not based on any kind of semantic hierarchy. Now Morrow also has an applicative construction, a beneficiary applicative construction that can add an object argument. So in 13a we see an intransitive in 13b I sang for the woman with, uh, with woman showing up as a typical object. And in 14 we see all of the expected object behaviors um, on this applicative argument. In 15 we see that if you add an applicative to a transitive verb you end up with a ditransitive um, construction. And again we get the expected ambiguity. He found the boy for the girl, he found the girl for the boy. And both of those objects end up just in the postverbal position, one after the other. Um, both of these internal objects can, um, arguments can exhibit the object properties. So accused of marking in 16a, in 16b. Um, and then uh, represented as object markers, as in 17. And finally, passivization, as in 18. And, and then again, we find the expected simultaneous object property. So 19A with two, two object markers and 19B with an object marker and passivization. Now, if you take a ditransitive predicate and add an applicative, then you end up with a construction that has three objects. And this is illustrated in 20. And notice you have the three objects, one right after the other, after the verb, um, with the um, accused of marker on it. And amazingly, this is six ways ambiguous, which is exactly as what we've come to expect. Um, and further, further evidence for simultaneous object status in the triple object constructions comes from these various combinations of object markers and passivization. I'm not going to go through this for reasons of time, but you can get all different various combinations. So the evidence for the symmetrical objects in Moro come from inherent ditransitives, applicatives, and we didn't talk about causatives, but they also come from causatives. Both objects display the full range of object behaviors, both individually and simultaneously, up to three symmetrical objects, all exhibi exhibiting object behaviors. And so in absence of other compelling factors, this argues they should be treated identically in their syntactic encoding. Now what I'm going to do next is talk um, briefly about a, minim a minimalist approach to this type of problem, in the, which has been um, given in the context of Bantu symmetrical objects. Um, now, there are two assumptions that produce a syntactic asymmetry between multiple objects. One has to do with binary branching, and the other is the VP shell that was proposed in Larson 1988. So these two assumptions eventually led to a clause structure where each syntactic argument is associated with a separate projection, and thus double object constructions require three VP internal projections. And you can see this in the following diagram, where the external argument is the specifier of the little VP, the goal argument is the specifier of some other projection, often an applicative phrase, and then the theme is inside the inner VP. The problem with this is that locality then will predict that only the goal should be able to passivize, as in the first diagram in 26, because in the second diagram, if you try to passivize the theme, it has to cross the goal. Now this violates a uh, principle of shortest move. Shortest move is a generalization of relativized minimality which prevents an argument from moving across another C commanding specifier. However, relativized minimality was formulated in much simpler times and um, among other things derived the specified subject constraint which was a fairly well motivated, empirically motivated um, um, constraint that disallowed uh, super raising. But once you add the post Larsonian clause structure then shortest move suddenly um, blocks all kinds of intraclausal movements and therefore it predicts that themes should not be able to pacify across goals. So what begat, so uh, this conceptually motivated extension of an empirically motivated principle then results in inappropriate restrictiveness. Now the workaround that you often find has something of the following flavor. Um, the theme moves up, crosses the goal as a second specifier, and then from that second specifier position is able to move on up and passivize. Now you may wonder why, what is a speci second specifier? Well, um, that movement didn't violate shortest move because of the technical definition of equidistance and either because that movement's optional or because the two specifiers are then equidistant from the subject position, either the goal or theme can eventually advance to subject through passivization. 
And the thing that triggers that theme movement to the second specifier is a stipulated EPP feature that just forces the movement. And so it's essentially a language and construction specific um, parameter that's absent in languages or constructions that asymmetrically allow only the goal to passivize. Um, thus, asymmetrical constructions are tied to the presence or absence of the relative, uh, relevant EPP feature. Now, this requires a number of ancillary assumptions, including specific notions of equidistance, multiple specifiers, tucking in movements, all whose sole purpose is to selectively circumvent the predictions of shortest move. So the larger theoretical issue um, is clear. While binary branching, Utah, and shortest move all have simple formulations, their actual implementations as applied to particular instances requires some degree of elasticity. Um, so, Given such necessary and complex modifications, are there simpler and more transparent ways to address cross-linguistic variation in the behavior of objects? And I'll turn it over to Rob. Okay, so when we turn to how we might cover something like this in HPSG, the first question then would be, well, where do the asymmetries come from in asymmetric languages? Um, HPSG shares the property with minimalism that we don't take grammatical functions as theoretical primitives. The asymmetry of objects in English or other asymmetric languages is derived from their asymmetry in the uh, representation here, the argument structure, um, the argument structure list. Unlike in minimalism, however, the, the structure in which, the, the structure that gives us the asymmetry of objects in asymmetric languages is not by any fundamental principle isomorphic to the semantic structure, so it's not necessarily the same as the, the um, thematic roles here, and it's also not necessarily the same as the syntactic positions or the constructions that you might realize these sorts of things. Right, there are certainly relationships between them, but these aren't fundamental principles of how the theory works. So when we come to a language which allow, which does not give us evidence for these asymmetries, a natural account for that might be to shift to a representation for those objects which doesn't have asymmetries in it. So instead of specifying the argument structure as a list, a totally ordered structure, we can specify it as a partially ordered structure. There's no evidence in Morrow that the theme outranks the patient or the patient outranks the theme at this particular level. So in Morrow it simply doesn't. There's, there's no evidence for a relationship between um, for a, a hierarchical <coughs> relationship between them. That doesn't then break anything else because we still have, there's still going to be a difference between a theme and a patient in the semantics, and as we'll see in a second, these things do have to occur in some order in the syntax, but as far as the argument structure is concerned, the level at which things like grammatical functions in HPSG happen, um, these things are, are uh, parallel. Right, so as I say, these things do have to occur in some order. Right? We have to get from a, uh, the argument structure to the valence. In, a, in the standard formulation of this, we say that the valence is made up of the subject is whatever the first, the highest ranking argument is, and the complements are the remaining ones. Right? We can do this through a sort of a, um, a pen operation here. If the argument structure is partially ordered, then we maybe need to specify this a little more. We can say that the combination of the subject and complements has to be some linear extension of the argument structure. Whatever precedence relations are specified in the argument structure have to be respected in the syntactic expression of those. In a language like English, the argument structure already is a, a total order, and so there's nothing, there's nothing mysterious happening. In a language like um, Morrow, however, the argument realization principle will give us two possible realizations of this. Either the theme <coughs> argument here could wind up as the second complement and the patient as the first, or the theme argument could wind up as the second complement and the patient as the, or the first complement and the patient as the second. Right? Either of those are a possible linear extension of the partially ordered argument structure. Right? So then we try to look at to see how the, the object properties, of, the <coughs> properties of objects in Mora would follow from this. So remember the, the properties are the, the uh, objects follow the predicates. The um, objects can be marked with accusative case if they're proper names. The argument, the objects can be expressed by pronominal markers on the verb. Well, one way to account for that would be 
using one of the techniques that have been proposed for, say, romance clitics. Right? And there's been a number of different devices proposed for that. So here I've given two kind of brute force lexical rules to take compliments, um, remove compliments, move, remove items from the compliments list, and specify the corresponding arguments as being phenomenal. Right? With a little bit fancy technology, we could do a Miller and Sog version of this with types that wouldn't require two rules, but have basically the same effect. So either or both of the, the um, arguments or the three arguments in a, one of these three object constructions could be uh, realized using a, uh, do you get three phenomenal markers on here? Or two? You do? You do, okay, so there could be, a, <laughs> all three of them could be. All right, for the passive, all right, that's, that's the fourth object property. Using the passive lexical rule, um, so there's one formulation of it, where we take the first item of the argument structure, right, and suppress it. Um, the, first, um, the first item in the argument structure in this case would be one that doesn't have anything preceding it. There may be more than one possibility for this. And right, if we apply this to our, to our um, lex a little lexical entry for the verb to give, we wind up with a structure like this. Right, where there are two object or two arguments here that aren't, in, or aren't ordered with respect to each, each other. And then either of them could be realized as the subject, part of the passive construction. So we could get either the theme or the patient being promoted by to the subject through the passive construction. All right, so I seem sort of like cheating, right? We had this, this intuition, this observation that, that objects in Moro are symmetric. And we kind of the analysis for that in HBSG is that objects in Moro are symmetric. They're not <laughs> ordered with relations. And we're able to do that because, you know, in a framework like minimalism, minimalism that's committed to, thank you, these, um, these properties of the language following from deep principles, of course, there's a way around it, but uh, we're left with kind of the question, the minimalist analysis of this leaves, with the, leaves us with the question like, well, why is it that some languages seem to violate these universal conditions on asymmetry? Or maybe, why is it that some languages hide the universal conditions on asymmetry and don't show them to us? They cover them up with something. Um, this alternative HPSG analysis, though, which lets us, to, lets us fairly directly state what the intuition is, but in a formal way that then leads to consequences that either are right or are wrong, lets us then ask the question, which we think is probably more fruitful, well, why is it that some languages are symmetric, and why is it that some languages are asymmetric in exactly the way that those languages happen to be symmetric or asymmetric? Because right? not all languages, we sort of looked at one case of symmetry here for one particular class of constructions, but not all symmetric languages are the same, and there are even more constructions in moral that we could, we could look at here. So um, this the framework allows us to, to specify exactly what our intuition is here in a transparent but formal way, which then leads to, we think, more interesting both empirical and theoretical questions about you know, where this all fits in and where it comes from. 